Good afternoon and welcome to everyone to this panel devoted to the scramble for the Eastern Mediterranean. This virtual panel is uh, organized by ISPI uh, in the framework of a Rome-Med Mediterranean Dialogues, the uh, long year initiative of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation and uh, ISPI. This year marks the seventh edition of Rome Med Dialogues and the, uh, the, our uh, biggest event will be at the beginning of December, hopefully in, uh, uh, in Rome. I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished guests, our distinguished speakers, and uh, Nasser Altamimi, with welcome Nasser, who is a political economist, senior associate research fellow at ISP for the Mediterranean and Middle East Center. Mitat uh, Celik Pala, professor at Kadiraz uh, University in uh, Istanbul. Alessia Melkangi, associate research fellow ISP and uh, assistant professor at the University uh, of Sapienza in Rome, and also no resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. How many affiliations? And uh, um, Gabriel Mitchell, director of external relations at the Israeli Institute for Regional Foreign Policy in Jerusalem. Welcome, Gabriel. And last but not least, Zenona Ciarras, researcher at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, Rio. So welcome to, to everyone. And we will focus on a, a very um, important topic uh, th this afternoon. Over the last uh, years, the Eastern Mediterranean has been under the international uh, spotlight as it turned uh, into a major hotspot for competition among regional players, and not only regional players, several international uh, actors uh, uh, are involved uh, and uh, operate in, uh, in the area. We talk about uh, competition uh, for uh, energy resources, uh, but also about geopolitical competition for uh, regional influence, as uh, uh, th that makes this part of the Mediterranean a piece of a greater um, puzzle of the Middle East and uh, North Africa, of the MENA uh, region puzzle. More than 10 years ago, gas discoveries uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean were expected to foster a regional cooperation and to be a driver for uh, the solution of long-standing disputes and crises uh, uh, that affect regional stability. However, while gas discovery was the catalyst of cooperation for some countries, it was on the other end uh, the reason of uh, uh, increasing tensions uh, among, uh, uh, among other, uh, other countries. Since the beginning uh, of 2021, after uh, um, an escalation of, um, of tensions, that uh, reached its peak last summer. So uh, since the beginning of this year, uh, we have witnessed uh, the escalation uh, in the area with uh, uh, resumptions of talks uh, between uh, Greece and, uh, and Turkey, several uh, attempts from the Turkish side uh, to, um, to detain, to uh, rapprochement with other uh, regional players. Against uh, this backdrop, uh, gas exploration and exploitation uh, activities are just one side of, uh, of the coin, just one side of, uh, of the issue. Uh, so uh, we will try to understand with uh, our uh, speakers, with our experts, uh, what are uh, the interests and the, the, the agendas of uh, the countries uh, involved, of the regional countries. We will try uh, to analyze and to understand what are the implications 
implications of their moves or their, their policies uh, on the regional stability, on the regional uh, security context, a uh, security complex, uh, we, can, uh, we can say. And we will see which factors uh, could contribute uh, to overcome divergences and uh, what room for uh, a wider cooperation. I would like to start uh, with uh, Gabriel Mitchell uh, trying to understand the Israeli uh, views, uh, the Israeli perspective. Uh, Israel is uh, one of the, uh, of the major player, uh, players in the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, the first country where gas uh, fields were discovered uh, more than uh, 10 years ago. So, Gabriel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to ISPI for, for hosting this really important conversation. Um, obviously, you know, as you framed it, Israel was one of the first countries in which uh, offshore hydrocarbons were discovered in the 21st century. For most of Israel's history, Israel was effectively an energy island dependent on importing its fossil fuels from, at times, the far corners of the globe, in large part due to uh, its contentious relations uh, with its Arab neighbors and a long-standing Arab boycott, which at times extended to uh, much of uh, the commercial sector as well. So um, the discovery of offshore hydrocarbons was a transformative event within uh, Israeli domestic politics, within uh, Israeli energy policy, and certainly from the Israeli perspective is the kind of touched, uh, touchstone upon which many of the Eastern Mediterranean's greater geopolitical implications have, uh, ha have flourished from. But I, I think that there are two other developments from the Israeli perspective that are of equal importance. Uh, the first is the very gradual U.S. Uh, withdrawal or, or the reduction of American uh, military uh, facilities in the region, uh, both in the Middle East and North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean more broadly, which has forced both Israel and some of the other actors in the region to kind of reassess their strategic needs um, and who are potential partners for cooperation. And certainly one of the traditional partners uh, that Israel for many years had a strong strategic relationship with was Turkey. But over the last 10 years, Israel's relationship with Turkey has soured. Uh, its set of strategic interests with Turkey uh, has diverged in a, in a number of uh, different ways. And so those two significant geopolitical uh, partners for Israel um, have, uh, have in, in essence, either uh, been replaced by a new set of actors and a new set of partners in the region, or are just diminished in their presence and their engagement and involvement um, in, in regional affairs. So those are the three core developments, energy discoveries, uh, the withdrawal of the United States, and um, the, uh, the fragmentation of the Israel-Turkey relationship that has really formulated and, and shaped Israel's thinking over the last 10 years. Um, and in essence, I think that Israel's goals in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean can be defined as such. First, to contribute to the establishment of a, a framework for regional integration and cooperation that addresses the commercial, commercial and geopolitical benefits of hydrocarbon exploration and the most uh, visible example of that, of that is the formation of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, um, upon which uh, uh, to which Israel is a member. Um, in addition, in addition uh, is Israel is seeking to uh, find multilateral solutions multilateral solutions to adapt to the U.S. withdrawal from the region. So, Sierras. Uh, Greece and Cyprus. Uh, first, Cy Cyprus, the second, uh, the country where, uh, secondly, where uh, gas fields were were discovered, we, and with uh, a country which is at the, the center of uh, of disputes in uh, in the area. So, uh, what are uh, the drivers of uh, Cyprus policy in uh, in the area? 
taking into account gas uh, explorations uh, and exploitation, but not only uh, energy activities. The yes, floor is uh, yours. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and um, the opportunity to discuss these things um, in such a um, you know, crucial period in time. Um, I, I had to cover um, Greece as well um, in my um, uh, research. Um, but there are many similarities between um, the two countries, uh, Cyprus and Greece, in terms of drivers and interests um, in, the, in the Eastern Mediterranean, traditionally, but also um, in a more contemporary setting. Um, I, I, I will start by saying that um, the two countries never really had an independent foreign policy until rather recently. Uh, they were uh, attached to external powers and I should add that Cyprus is a very, you know, a very uh, a new uh, state, a new republic, only established in 19, 1960. Um, Europeanization then had an effect on on how their preferences and how their worldview was were shaped. Um, a, a Greece in the 1980s and Cyprus in 2004, uh, which uh, led them to a clearly uh, Western orientation. Of course, Greece was is is an, a NATO member since 1952 as well, so more embedded in the Western security structure. Uh, but then we had the, the 2000s and the and the emergence of, um, according to many uh, scholars, of a post-American world, and the effects that this um, global change had on a regional level as well. Um, I am one of those who believe that um, this post-American world dynamics or this partial retreat of, of American hegemony from the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean had important effects about regional dynamics, which obviously affected um, Cyprus and Greece as well. Um, in, my, in my view, um, Turkish foreign policy is one of the main uh, products of this global change. Uh, because the, the American retreat has created a vacuum that um, uh, has allowed um, Turkey, in conjunction with obviously domestic factors as well, domestic changes, to pursue um, its own agenda more uh, assertively. Uh, this, um, uh, in the end, um, uh, led to a change of international relations in the region, as Gabi was mentioning earlier, um, deteriorations of relations with Israel and Egypt. For Greece and Cyprus, this was a huge opportunity to create a new network of cooperation and, and construct a new, uh, let's say, an, a new architecture that would uh, serve their traditional concerns. Their traditional concerns, which are the main concerns today, um, is to deal with uh, the Turkish threat as they uh, understand, perceive, and experience it. Um, Greek, uh, Greece with traditional problems uh, in the Aegean, uh, for example, since the 1970s, and um, Cyprus, obviously, at least since the 1960s, uh, the so-called Cyprus problem or Cyprus issue. So these are the main security problems. I, I, I don't have the time to get deeper into it, but these are the main traditional problems that these two countries face in terms of security and survival um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. But the 2010s uh, came with new changes. We had the Arab Spring, we had the, the, the rise of ISIS, we had the uh, discovery of hydrocarbons, and so on. So this sort of um, uh, contributed to, to this new architecture that was emerging in the region, and that Cyprus and Greece wanted to, uh, to push. And this was an architecture based on cooperation on multi-level cooperation between um, uh, Cyprus, Greece, Israel, Egypt, and some other states like Jordan, and later on France, the United Arab Emirates, uh, and so on. And it was mainly, uh, rather, it had two uh, objectives. One was to deal with the Turkish threats or to contain it or to, let's say, um, uh, minimize its effects and its uh, implications for Greece and Cyprus. But at the same time, the, the other uh, goal was to uh, find areas of beneficial cooperation with other states, be it in, in the area of economy, of, of energy, 
and so on. And that's why we ended up having the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum um, as part of this, you know, uh, regional integration equation. Um, so the stakes right now um, for, for Greece and Cyprus, beyond the traditional ones, uh, um, have also the aspect of these two countries wanting to play, um, let's say, an agenda setting role in the area. Uh, along with other partners, obviously, um, and uh, wanting to have, especially Greece, wanting to have a more important role in, in the Western alliance as a, as a Western partner in the region, given that uh, Turkish-US or Turkish-NATO relations are deteriorating and Greece feels like it can, um, you know, uh, provide an alternative for Western interests. Now, um, Cyprus is not in a position to do that, but it is uh, still trying to enhance and deepen the relationship with, with, uh, with the US, with international companies, energy companies that, that are operating within the Cypriot exclusive, exclusive economic zone, and also regional partners. Again, through gas, through economic energy and other co cooperation to come back and be able to, to leverage all that for what it considers an existential threat, which is the Cyprus problem, which is Turkey, but also acquire some leverage in on the table of negotiations for the resolution of the Cyprus problem. Um, these are so I'm trying to bring together the stakes and the strategies uh, all at the same time. Um, and uh, I, I want to close with this because there's uh, too much to say. I don't want to take time, but. Um, uh, there is this understanding that, that the Eastern Mediterranean is somehow divided, polarized between North and South. You, you, you know, that's a virtual um, scheme. Turkey in the North and the rest of them in, in the South. And there is an effort to, to, to pursue and push for regionalism in the South uh, as a way of uh, counterbalancing Turkey or deterring Turkey. However, if we're talking about the future of cooperation in the Eastern Mediterranean, the, I, I, a co competition is understandable, but we will have to explore ways of cooperation as well beyond the traditional antagonism and, and competition. Um, but the way to do that is a big question, a big question mark, and perhaps a parallel structure that does not carry the, the geopolitical and historic uh, historical weight that other relations do in the region might be a, a thought about the way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zenonas. And before uh, uh, going back uh, to, to Gabi, I'd like to uh, to turn first uh, to uh, Mitat, as Zenona mentioned, uh, Turkey. Turkey is uh, the other uh, uh, major player uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, um, Zenona said that uh, the uh, active and uh, even assertive uh, policy uh, carried out by, by Turkey over the last years uh, could be uh, seen also as uh, the result of uh, uh, the US uh, partial retreat uh, or reduced engagement in, uh, in the area. What uh, is uh, your opinion, uh, Mitat? What are the drivers uh, of Turkey's foreign policy, of Turkey's action in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean? Hey, Valeria, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be part of such a kind of a distinguished uh, team, in fact, to discuss this very uh, famous, in fact, uh, issue in, in the current political environment. Uh, you are right. And of course, uh, I had a chance uh, together with Zenonas many times in different, play, uh, different meetings or seminars. I, I agree in basically uh, what he says. And uh, I, I can say that Turkey with the longest shoreline in the Eastern Mediterranean is one of the main actors in the region. But unfortunately, uh, for currently, it is representing uh, the other polar of the equation in the Eastern Mediterranean. There are reasons, of course, why Turkey is uh, setting itself on the other side of this balance and uh, receives a kind of a, a threat uh, from the region itself. Uh, 
Uh, currently, most probably, it seems that Ankara is excluded uh, from all energy projects and security settings developed in the region very currently. And this has direct implications for the region's current and future security order. And for Ankara, the issue has never been only about energy or natural gas. Uh, it is not possible to separate natural gas issues, of course, or energy-related is issues from sensitive political and geopolitical matters uh, in Turkey's environment, and consequently Ankara as a regional power or an actor, uh, a potential energy hub, has been closely monitoring all the developments in the Eastern Mediterranean Basin. Therefore, as my colleagues mentioned, this is the case why T Turkey is following very aggressive and assertive foreign policy or security policy very currently in this region. Uh, as Zenonas mentions, uh, what Greeks or Cypriots feel uh, in Turkey, strangely enough, uh, feels the same. Uh, Turkey's political elite perceived new developments and rising security challenges in the countries near abroad as a threat to Turkey's sovereignty and territorial integrity. This is not only the, the Eastern Mediterranean related issues, but I may say among those developments, some geopolitical rivals in the region, Turkey's problematic bilateral relations with the regional actors, especially Greece, Egypt, Israel, and Libya, and others as well. And the limitation of maritime boundaries within the region, this is also an issue, defining exclusive economic zones, uh, the unresolved nature of Cyprus issue, soaring Turkey-EU relations, and, and, and soaring EU, uh, Turkey-US relations. And in addition to all those foreign policy related concerns, as Zenon has mentioned, this domestic developments within Turkey also became a kind of a significant roadblock standing in the way of the realization of Turkey's political, economic and energy related relations and plans in general. Uh, since 2016, I may say that uh, as the situation in the East Med started to evolve and existing problems such as Cyprus, Turkish Greek relations became more acute as new variables entered into the equation, including the discovery of hydrocarbon reserves in the ISMED, the Arab Spring and the civil war in Syria and Libya, issue get much complicated. Uh, and the rapid escalation of tensions between Turkey and the other key states in the energy equation in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, such as Israel and Cyprus, of course, Greece and Egypt, has had a significant impact on the region's upcoming energy projects. And now Turkey, which was part of nearly every kind of energy project in the region, or it's near abroad, is now obviously excluded, and Ankara is therefore considered nowadays more as a potential client rather than a transit state or, 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 or a member state of all those equations. And recently, Turkey has uh, upped its policy in the region against what it perceives as a uh, how can I say, a kind of a wider conspiracy against it, Turkey's national interests or regional interests. For Ankara, for example, Turkish sovereign rights to its continental shelf and safeguarding the equal rights of Turkish cities are at stake. And then this perspective brings us to the concept of blue homeland or Mavi Vatan. And this is the, the concept that we are discussing very, very lively and very effectively. And this is a motto that defines Ankara's cur current maritime strategy, especially for the Mediterranean uh, Sea that emerged in 2006. Uh, but this rhetoric has emerged as a pillar of Turkey's policies in the region, linking it to the Aegean and also to the Black Sea region as well. Therefore, in the current competitive Eastern Mediterranean environment, the concept turned out to be a strategy that rests on the pillars to define and safeguard uh, de and develop Turkey's maritime rights and national interests in the 21st century regarding the areas of maritime jurisdiction, uh, including the territorial waters, the continental shelf, and the EEZ as well. And perceived as an expansionist doctrine by the outsiders, especially our Greek and, and of course, Cypriot colleagues, this concept used as a shorthand expression for Ankara's maritime claims around its mainland. Uh, also represents a link to Turkey's deep existential insecurity and the discovery of large deposits of natural gas off the coast of island uh, of Cyprus, of course, and attempts at utilizing those resources without Turkish or Turkish Cypriot involvement seem to be the immediate trigger of Turkey's recent rhetorical upsurge uh, regarding the Eastern Mediterranean. This is the perspective. 
In other words, I may say that although the Mediterranean crisis is the most often um, boiled down to Turkey's claims for maritime borders and hydrocarbon reserves or deposits, it's more about a wider security thinking and culture that has been taking uh, shape over the uh, last decade. Therefore, in a conclusion, I may say that two main components of this security policy for Turkey uh, focused on East Med, but more general. The first component is the about of the fear of being under attack or being circled by outside powers. Uh, there is a kind of perceived that there, there is a belligerent coalition of uh, some Gulf states, Egypt, Jordan, or other Middle Eastern countries, uh, and they are backed by uh, former Turkey allies, Israel, Greece, and France. And uh, they are trying to counter Turkey's influence in the region. This is the reason why energy form is perceived as a threat uh, for Ankara and then being aware of its lack of allies and its encirclement. Turkey now de depends on more on its military and becomes more proactive or assertive to counter such an attempt. This creates a, a threatened environment, an unbalanced environment, uh, and, and trigger many issues. The second component related with this issue is about the regional ambitions of Turkey, of course. And the, the Mediterranean has been transformed into a region of vital importance for Turkey, uh, with a recent return of great power competition to project power in the Levant region and North Africa is an issue. Uh, my, my colleague mentioned the US withdrawal from the region uh, and EU's ineffectiveness. And then there is a kind of a self-help system. We see Russia as a partner country to Turkey, not only in the Mediterranean, but in the Black Sea and the other seas as well. Therefore, Turkey's threat perception is, is different than the other regional actors. And it seems that uh, Turkey's presence in Libya, in Syria, in the East Met, and all of them are interconnected to each other. And what is important is uh, Turkey's missing connections with its Western allies and Western partners. Therefore, there's a kind of a reciprocal uh, threat perception by the European allies, NATO allies of Turkey, and Turkey's perception of threat from the same and sources. Therefore, what we need is most probably to, 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 to accept the, the, the box and to find new ways of thinking uh, and then some, we need to produce some recommendations, not only for Turkish decision makers, but for the other European colleagues and the regional actors as well, uh, to normalize the region. And this is the setup that affects not only Turkey's um, Eastern Mediterranean policies, but Turkey's much more general and broader security and foreign policy priorities, uh, together with the domestic issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mitat, for uh, your uh, uh, clear and in-depth analysis of uh, Turkey's uh, uh, interests, uh, Turkey's uh, uh, domestic drivers uh, and Turkey's foreign policy drivers uh, in shaping its uh, external projection uh, above all uh, in the, this part of, uh, of the Mediterranean. Just back to, um, to Gabriel Mitchell uh, for uh, its uh, uh, second part of uh, the analysis on, uh, on uh, Israel. Gabi, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, was, I was detailing essentially Israel's uh, goals in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, I highlighted the importance from an Israeli perspective to establish a framework for regional cooperation on energy issues to find multilateral solutions to cope with the gradual U.S. withdrawal. And I very much believe that, you know, from an Israeli perspective, those solutions will be uh, and should be done in concert with American leadership um, to find the right strategic architecture uh, so that it meets both American interests and the United States still has many interests in the region, while also meeting the interests and the needs of regional uh, actors such as Israel uh, and Greece and Cyprus, who are part of the three plus one, um, but other, uh, other regional actors as well. Um, the support of a norms-based framework for uh, maritime issues. You know, uh, it's been mentioned by, by my colleagues that there are 
ongoing maritime delimitation disputes in the region. Israel is not uh, it is not uh, uh, different in that regards. Um, there are ongoing uh, negotiations between Israel and Lebanon over their maritime boundary, and there are outstanding disputes between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. So Israel, very much like the other actors in the region, is trying to find the best mechanism for uh, resolving and dealing with maritime issues, whether it be the delimitation of maritime boundaries or the monitoring of maritime traffic. Uh, and the assurance of maritime security. But I would add, and I think that this is something that is really crucially important, it touches on something that uh, Zenonas mentioned earlier, is that you know Israel, just like all the other actors in the region, is highly aware of the impact of climate change, uh, both on the maritime environment and, and in general. Um, and climate change and, and creating mechanisms and measures for cooperation in order to protect uh, the environment, but also to uh, engage in uh, some kind of proactive effort to reduce um, the dependency on fossil fuels is perhaps a way for actors in the region to cooperate with one another. And certainly what we've seen over the last year since the outbreak of the COVID pandemic is a concerted effort on the part of Israel's Ministry of Energy to uh, reset its uh, renewable uh, agenda, align it much closer to the European Green Deal, and start to think creatively about what kind of multilateral steps can be taken in order to uh, co combat climate change. Um, finally, two other things that I think are critically important to Israel's strategy is to manage its relationship with Turkey. It, Turkey remains an important economic partner for Israel. Israel recognizes Turkey's uh, strategic uh, position in the region. Um, and while the current dialogue between Israel and Turkey is not particularly constructive, um, Israel, I think, has gone out of its way to ensure that there's a, a, a window open for a normalization of relations with Turkey if and when Turkey is ready to have that conversation. And of course, relations may not return to the way they were in the 1990s, let's say, but Israel is leaving that door open while at the same time fostering and developing a new set of relationships with other actors in the region, including Greece and Cyprus and Egypt, and of course, uh, it's uh, new normalization partners in the Gulf states. And that is a real segue to, I think, one of Israel's uh, primary goals in the Eastern Mediterranean, because the regional space is overlapping with a lot of other regional architectures. And I think that for Israel, one of the uh, key goals is to essentially bridge the developments in the Eastern Mediterranean into other regional spaces where Israel already has a large set of interests. So projects that can bridge the Eastern Mediterranean to Europe, such as the Euro-Asia Interconnector, uh, which will effectively connect Israel's uh, electrical grid to that of Europe's, um, is a, a project that Israel sees as a way to take the, the developments of the Eastern Mediterranean and bridge them with its interests in Europe. And similarly, take those interests in the Eastern Mediterranean and bridge them to its new partners in the Gulf uh, and, and in Africa as well. So Israel sees, I think, the Eastern Mediterranean as a, as a, as a hub of uh, diplomatic activity, um, but it does not, it would not want to limit the potential of the Eastern Mediterranean within the boundaries of that regional space. It's constantly seeking and looking for partners, whether it be France, whether it be Italy, uh, and whether it be other actors um, outside of this regional space to take part in regional project, pro, uh, projects and to find find areas for cooperation. I want to add just kind of a, a, a final note because it, it ties into something that uh, Mitat had, had mentioned, and that's the, the question of, you know, engagement with Turkey. And I think that for Israel, it's it's been a, a, a vexing issue of how to maintain some kind of a, of a dialogue with Turkey while understanding the fact that, at least for the foreseeable future, Turkey's strategic interests and power projected in, in the region may not uh, coalesce with Israel's interests, nor the interests of Israel's regional partners. And I think that one of the one of the key examples and something that's often overlooked is that when Israel and Turkey normalized relations 
first in 2016, energy was at the very least at a discursive level, a central part of that normalization package that there would be negotiations about the prospects of energy cooperation. And until uh, as late as 2018, Israel and Turkey were engaged in negotiations about the prospect of energy cooperation. And those negotiations fell through over price. So I think that while we can talk about um, you know, uh, parties in the region not being interested in cooperating with Turkey. And I understand the fact that, you know, different actors may have a different set of interests and calculus and, and when, they're, when they're addressing Turkey. But I do think that on the one hand, it's easy to kind of package everything and frame everything as it currently exists today. But this region has been rapidly evolving over the last decade. And I, I don't think that it does anyone a, any, any, uh, any benefit to kind of narrowly identify everything as, as one way. Things are changing and they could change again in the months and in the years to come. Thank you, thank you very much. Gabby, you raised a lot of uh, interesting points. So the Eastern Mediterranean as a bridge uh, connecting uh, Europe, uh, the Middle East, uh, Asia. And, uh, uh, but I would like to, to ask you a question uh, uh, related to uh, what you said, uh, how to engage uh, Turkey with Turkey. It's, the, it's the, the one of the main uh, issue. And do you see any possibility to include Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum uh, in uh, the short, medium term? It, in the short term, the answer is no. But the, the reason is based on uh, the experience of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum just a few months ago, all it takes is one country to veto a proposed uh, new member in order for that vote to fall. So um, in the case of the, the EMGF just, you know, a few weeks ago, um, the Palestinian Authority vetoed the uh, entry of the UAE as an observer, right? So even if Israel was on board with the idea of Turkey joining the EMGF, you would need a consensus across the, uh, the forum's many members each of whom have their own uh, disputes with Turkey to, to be on board. But I do think that there's opportunity for cooperation. And I think that the first way to start is to essentially change the dynamics of the conversation away from hydrocarbons, most of which have already been uh, you know, allocated and contracts have been signed, um, but really to be talking about climate change over the last couple of weeks, we've all seen the images of mucilage developments around the Sea of, uh, sea of Marmara. Uh, Turkey is not alone in the Eastern Mediterranean to experience the effects of climate change. And, uh, and I think that that might be a way of having a constructive dialogue about common issues um, and perhaps using that as a springboard for uh, further conversations about other uh, issues pertaining to uh, uh, maritime boundaries and perhaps energy cooperation. Thanks, Gabby. Very interesting. So climate change co could be a, a sector for, for future cooperation. And, uh, we, but we will back uh, on, on this uh, as I would like to have the opinion of uh, the other panelists. So, but now uh, turn to, to Egypt, another important uh, player uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the area. And, uh, but I would like to ask you, um, Alessia, how uh, to engage with Turkey. But uh, first of all, uh, but we will back on this uh, later on. But first of all, uh, what are the main drivers of uh, Egypt's uh, policy in, uh, in the region, above all after the discoveries of a uh, uh, gas field, uh, of the uh, biggest gas field in the Eastern Mediterranean in 2015 of the coast of, uh, of Egypt? So over to you, Alessia. 
Thank you, Valeria, and uh, good afternoon to all. I'm uh, delighted to be among these uh, distinguished experts to discuss about the current uh, Eastern Mediterranean geopolitics, uh, geopolitical context. Um, let me also thank CISPI for organizing uh, such an important uh, event uh, to address directly uh, your question about uh, Egyptian interest in the Eastern Mediterranean, the main drivers of uh, its uh, politics. Uh, Egypt is uh, currently committed to relaunch the country's image among regional competitors in order to recap its historical role as a strategic pivot in the Mediterranean. Um, centrally, in this context, the Eastern Mediterranean represents a line of strategic intervention uh, due to the relevance of the basin as the new hotspot for the global energy market and new uh, arena for regional actors, geopolitical competition, as you said before. Of course, Egypt has an uh, important interest connected with the energy sector. Uh, the country ob obtained uh, agreed success in the beginning of 2019, uh, when President al-Sisi officially declared uh, the achievement of the country's natural gas self-sufficiency, thanks to the increased production of the Zor and Nur offshore gas field, thus covering the internal needs. Uh, achieving natural gas, uh, gas self-sufficiency and the ramping up production and distribution of uh, liquefied natural gas, uh, thanks to the launch of Idco and Damietta liquefaction plants, uh, align perfectly uh, with Cairo's economic priority. First of all, manage its natural gas resources in the most effective way to serve its domestic energy needs. And this will require maintaining the momentum of exploration and development in order to compensate for the depletion of existing fields and to accommodate rising demand. And second, garner revenue from exporting any surplus gas that it can produce, becoming a regional provider for energy trade. Uh, the interest in uh, leveraging Eastern Mediterranean gas reserves led Egypt to bet on increased cooperation between Greece, Cyprus, Israel, which won Cairo signed bilateral deals for the delivery of gas to the liquefaction facilities in the country. Uh, this grouping culminated, uh, uh, as said before, in the creation of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum uh, in January 2019, uh, a platform aimed at developing a regional gas market, starting by taking advantage of the existing uh, uh, liquefied natural gas infrastructure in Egypt and supporting the construction of the uh, subsea East Med gas pipeline to Italy. At least uh, the deal with Greece uh, in economic energy fields and on areas of security. Uh, President Al Sisi last March confirmed an agreement signed on August 2020 with the Athens government regarding the designation of the exclusive economic zone that impinges on a zone part of the Turkey and the then Libyan government national accord deal. Uh, all these moves um, uh, confirm the will of these countries to strengthen a broader alliance, to relaunch their position in the Eastern Mediterranean, but also to counter Turkish assertiveness for gaining control of a large part of the basin. Uh, Israel and Egypt had a tradition of uh, acrimonious relations with Turkey. Uh, while the gas forms anti turkish land has also attracted the Emirates, which are engaged in an acute regional rivalry with Turkey. Uh, like Egypt, the Emirates takes issue with Turkey's support from Azim Brotherhood movement across the region. Uh, thus, uh, all the Cairo attempts to announce its influence in the Eastern Mediterranean further exacerbated the dispute with Ankara. As we will know, Ankara reacted to this block by taking the field in the Libyan crisis, which represents a strategic geopolitical node for Egypt. Uh, in fact, besides uh, energy interests, there are the geopolitical ones. Egypt uh, focused on the energy factor as a tool for its geopolitical ambitions and for protecting its interests in the Mediterranean, such in Libya. Uh, the tension between Ankara and Cairo have spilled over into the Libyan crisis after the Ankara's signature of a memorandum of understanding uh, uh, with Tripoli along the maritime demarcation border uh, that would allow Turkey to drill energy resources in Cyprus and Greek offshore. Uh, this agreement can be read as a Turkish strategy to reshape its position in the Mediterranean energy dispute, of course, and the Turkish presence in this fundamental area was always perceived by Al-Sisi as an alarming threat. 
the long-standing conflict within the Sun Sunni world that sees Turkey and Qatar support soft political Islam against Emirates, Saudi Arabia, the Egypt was transferred into the Libyan front. It is evident that Egypt can hardly accept a Turkish-friendly Islamist government in Libya that controlled the Libyan Egyptian border because Cairo needs to safeguard its force Western frontier border in Syria and prevent dangerous uh, jihadist penetration from Eastern Libya. Uh, to conclude, uh, uh, of course, we, uh, recently we are witnessing to a, a possible reconfiguration of uh, geopolitical dynamics in the basin uh, as a consequence of the uh, current restoration of diplomatic ties among rivals regional actors, uh, such as the current attempt to rapprochement between Egypt and Turkey. Uh, but also uh, Turkey recent diplomatic initiative to settle outstanding dispute with Israel and uh, Saudi Emirates bloc. Uh, if all these initiatives will develop with positive outcomes, uh, they would have direct consequence on the Eastern Mediterranean context. Uh, context. Uh, of course, that remains uh, to be seen in the next month. Thank you, thank you, uh, Alessia, for your uh, very clear uh, analysis and presentation. And there is a, a question uh, uh, relating to this uh, possibility to um, normalize uh, uh, relations between Turkey and, uh, and uh, Egypt. Uh, a, a question from uh, our audience. Fl following the recent political oh. consultations in Cairo, what should we expect in terms of bilateral uh, reconciliation uh, between uh, Ankara and, uh, and Cairo? Um, the, the, the last uh, bilateral consultation that uh, 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 take place, uh, took place in, uh, in Cairo, uh, I think were really important in order to state uh, some areas of cooperation. So first of all, Libya, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the possibility to achieve a stabilization in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. And these are, of course, the two main areas of cooperation, and the most important element also for uh, Cairo and uh, for, uh, for Turkey. I think that uh, um, the, the relevance of uh, this uh, rapprochement between these two countries could have a consequence, uh, not only, of course, in Libya, uh, but also in the Eastern Mediterranean and the maritime border between these two countries. Uh, that uh, uh, a possible deal uh, on this regard would be a pri represent a priority and could become a starting point for talks between both sides. Uh, Turkey and Egypt uh, may negotiate the demarcation of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean borders uh, if the relation allows such a step. Uh, of course, our approachment with Egypt would uh, go a long way to ending the isolation of Ankara, an issue related to the Eastern Mediterranean, but at the same time, a reduction in tension will create a better environment for Egypt to make progress with its effort to sustain its own natural gas surplus, uh, and of course, uh, to control the situation in, uh, in Libya. So focusing its effort on the resolution of other very risky questions, of course, the Libya, but also the jar dispute with Ethiopia, or uh, uh, to control, to stabilize an uncertain economic situation. And I think also that, uh, of course, on the other side, the announcement of the restart of diplomatic talk between Egypt and Turkey provoked uh, different consequences in the other uh, regional actors, for example, in, Gre in, um, in Greek. Uh, the Greek government, uh, first, that any agreement on a direct maritime border between the two countries will support the Turkish narrative uh, on maritime rights in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, anyway, the current condition for an Ankara and Cairo appeasement uh, uh, make an agreement uh, unlikely. Also, if acting in tandem, Ankara and Ankara could ease the achievement of, uh, first of all, a political solution in Libya and a general appeasement in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, area. Um, I think that it is possible to think about uh, the creation of a sort of snowball effect, effect that could involve a general appeasement in the Eastern Mediterranean area, especially look at the uh, current uh, uh, situation. Thank you very much, uh, Alessia. And now we turn to... Uh, 
another part of, uh, of the Middle East uh, to the Gulf uh, uh, states, the Gulf monarchies, uh, especially United Arab Emirates, uh, uh, which was mentioned uh, uh, before. Uh, Gulf monarchies that uh, have been very active uh, in uh, the wider Mediterranean, in the MENA region, uh, above all after uh, the Arab uh, uprisings uh, in uh, 2011. So um, what are the interests of these states that are not uh, Mediterranean states uh, uh, stricto senso, but uh, uh, have a role, uh, have played a, uh, a greater and greater role uh, in, uh, in, in the region and also in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. I, tu uh, this, uh, I turn this question to Nasser Altamimi. Please, Nasser, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Valeria. And thank you for the invitation and uh, to include me even in this great panel and the great presentation. <coughs> the Gulf is <coughs> representing another angle. You know, the, we talk, everyone is, you know, talk about the maritime borders and uh, uh, hydrocarbon uh, reserve in the uh, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, but the, <coughs> the Gulf state represent another uh, another issues uh, and their their involvement in the area is related to geopolitics, uh, not to maritime, uh, because it's distance region from them. And it, it could be traced to the Arab uh, Spring. And, uh, uh, if, and we, 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 we talk about Gulf State, as you mentioned, the uh, Ferris is United Arab Emirates, uh, second Saudi Arabia, and then uh, uh, the uh, Qatar. Uh, the, these three countries, they have uh, ambitious <coughs> Uh, regional uh, foreign policy, and they are deploying uh, 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 their re uh, financial and economic resources to back this uh, uh, ambition. Uh, when we look back 10 years ago, uh, 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 after the Arab Spring, we could see that the, the Gulf region is split in two camps. Uh, one camp is including Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Arab Emirates, the other camp is uh, uh, Qatar, which aligned itself with uh, uh, to uh, with, with Turkey, and from there uh, we see uh, uh, evolving involvement from the Gulf state in the eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean, Mediterranean. That time, from that time, you know, uh, these uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, United Arab Emirates. They look at the region from geopolitics. First, they see that the Arab Spring is uh, creating a lot of chaos. Can you hear me? Uh, OK, uh, thank you. And uh, creating a lot of chaos for these countries, especially Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Arab Emirates. They were frightened that the, the Iranian will, uh, 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 from their perspective, the, the Iranian will uh, exploit that chaos and expand their uh, uh, influence in the region. The second uh, security uh, uh, threat perceived from uh, so Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, United Arab Emirates was the idyllic, uh, the, uh, the so-called, you know, uh, political Islam or mainly the Muslim Brotherhood, that they are security threat and the, if what's happening in at that time in Egypt and Tunisia and it could spread in the Gulf and uh, it, it create a new dynamic or it could double the regime or uh, 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 during the, the the early years of the Arab Spring and the third uh, the third uh, you know security threat from their perspective I, I'm talking about uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, United Arab Emirates and my colleagues already mentioned it the American dis disengagement in the region, you know, you will see that in 2011, the American, they uh, scaled down their involvement in Iraq. Uh, uh, and the, at the beginning of the Arab Spring, uh, which is, was ringing uh, strongly in the Gulf when Obama's the, uh, calling publicly for uh, Hosni Mubarak to step down. And uh, from that, you know, that, that development shaped the, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, and uh, 
United Arab Emirates, uh, their involvement in the region. From the Qatari side, <clears throat> this is, was very interesting as a result of the Arab Spring, is that the alignment or the, uh, uh, the converge of interest between uh, Qatar and, uh, and Turkey, and that relation was uh, uh, developing uh, uh, during the last de de uh, decade, and still, you know, as far as they uh, entered, converge or, uh, or aligned uh, together, it, it will uh, continue. <clears throat> So uh, we, in that context, you know, the Iranian threat uh, and also the third one, sorry, uh, the, they perceive the, uh, uh, also the Turkish rising influence. You know, they, the, the, they see the Turkish model uh, uh, aligning with the political Islam and do, with the election and all of that. So they see that uh, as a political threat for them. For, uh, these all elements push them to be very active in the region. We see in Saudi Arabia, they lead the Gulf state in, in Syria, supporting the Syrian uh, uh, rebels, because in that time they thought that if they double asset, uh, uh, they will stop the Iranian uh, uh, advancing to the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the other uh, the, the other issue is Turkey, and uh, uh, we see their uh, 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 position toward Turkey hardening all, all over the time, uh, especially after the Turkey sided with Turkey with uh, Qatar in 2007, and uh, later on, you know, the, uh, we could include the economic side which is uh, especially the United Arab Emirates, uh, they have, you know, if you, if, if you see that uh, 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 the, these three uh, Gulf actors, I could say that United Arab Emirates is the most ambitious uh, uh, player because they have a broader agenda, geopolitical agenda, and uh, even economic agenda. Uh, and uh, uh, their involvement also was... Uh, evolving regarding to regional development and uh, uh, international development, especially in the United States. We've seen them in Libya, very active, supporting General Haftar. Uh, we've seen them in uh, Libya uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia supporting the uh, uh, Sisi regime, you know, from their side to, to keep the, and uh, make Turkey as a uh, or uh, not using, uh, sorry, uh, or uh, uh, look at the, uh, Egypt as a counterbalance uh, for Turkey in the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, and then, you know, in, in the last couple of, in the last few years, uh, there is a lot of reassessment in their, in, in their policy. Uh, uh, they see in the American, they are changing uh, administration. They, uh, they see a lot of, uh, you know, things happening in the uh, Mediterranean. So we see the United Arab Emirates uh, and also the pandemic uh, uh, give them uh, like covered uh, or uh, excuse to, uh, uh, from their perspective, to pursue uh, political relation with, with Israel. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, uh, at the moment, uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, Gulf state, I would say the United Arab Emirates is the more most active uh, 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 player in that region. Uh, they are interested in the hydro hydrocarbon projects in the region. They are interested in, uh, in uh, 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 economic development, economic trade, uh, and also uh, <coughs> the way I, 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 I see the United Arab, Arab uh, Emirates, they took step further than Saudi Arabia and, uh, and uh, uh, Qatar established their relation with, uh, with Israel. And from U United Arab Emirates perspective, uh, they have many issues related to, uh, you know, to the eastern uh, uh, side, uh, eastern Mediterranean, and issue also related to America and their domestic uh, diversification, diversification program. Because they think that Israel will, you know, will, will be a good trade partner, uh, will help them and, uh, you know, expand their diversification program from tourism and uh, 
uh, real estate to a technology and uh, and we see the United Arab Emirates their sovereign fund is very active in this kind of uh, new technology and uh, artificial uh, this is that you know to to sum it up uh, there it start with geopolitics uh, and for you know to keep the status quo and uh, and keep them uh, the uh, uh, political Islam from power in the Arab Eastern. Uh, the second is uh, uh, they expanding their pol political diplomatic relation with uh, Greece and uh, and uh, uh, Cyprus and uh, if you see Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, their po political position uh, aligned with the, the Greece and uh, the uh, uh, Cyprus uh, in supporting them against uh, uh, Turkey. <clears throat> I think that's uh, the main issue. And thank, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Nasser, for uh, your very in-depth uh, intervention. You you mentioned the, the United States uh, and uh, um, the new Biden administration uh, has uh, inaugurated a, a different uh, foreign policy, uh, but uh, towards the Middle East there are. Uh, elements of uh, discontinuity and the element of, of continuity. And the, the question is, uh, from uh, the Gulf perspective, what changes uh, can we expect uh, in uh, the US posture uh, in, uh, in the region, uh, towards the, the region? Uh, I, I think uh, the American uh, position uh, how, uh, have a, a big impact in the Gulf state. Uh, especially Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, if you see the four years before, the Trump administration, his uh, core policy, or it depends on three countries, Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, and uh, Israel. And uh, he disengaged in most of the uh, uh, area, and that was incentive for Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates to escalate their involvement in, in, in Yemen and in Libya and in, in, even in the Eastern Mediterranean, you know, and uh, uh, develop a, a strong relation with uh, Greece and uh, the change of, uh, of the administration, I think it will cool down the, the relation with Saudi Arabia uh, and uh, they will have a lot of issues with the United Arab Emirates regarding China, uh, human rights issues and and not just the only the United States, also their policy in the region faces a lot of setbacks. You know, in Libya, uh, the involvement of uh, Turkey changing the balance uh, in, in, in Egypt, uh, the Egyptian government, they have their own interest and their own uh, you know, agenda regarding Libya. And, and, and some of it is collided with with the, uh, the United with the United Arab Emirates, and uh, so in my opinion, I don't think the fundamental issues or the disagreement among uh, uh, Gulf states, especially with Qatar, will disappear. It will be there, but I I, I would say it is a truce or this uh, this uh, you know the, this escalation of the but the main issues is still there. And uh, uh, the conflict could uh, flare up any time in the, in the future, changing of uh, the, uh, regional development or changing of the uh, uh, U.S. administration uh, or many uh, uh, domestic issues inside Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Arab Emirates. Thank you, thank you, uh, Nasser. And uh, I see that uh, many questions from the audience uh, arrived. So I will open the, the, the Q&A now, and uh, oh, I hope that we will have time to, to answer all, uh, all questions. We have a question from Dina, Dina Facuzza uh, for uh, Zenonas about the um, architecture you mentioned in uh, your intervention and what kind of parallel architecture away from traditional antagonism could be established and what are in your view uh, its uh, main components? 
Thank you very much. That's a, that's a very good question. Probably the one million dollar question. Um, but I, I'm going back to what Gabby said before, um, because I, th I think I think we need to to think outside the box, um, acknowledging that, um, as uh, as Nasser probably mentioned, um, that the, these new issues of of uh, hydrocarbons and energy resources are not standalone issues. They are connected to sovereignty and geopolitical traditional problems. So. Uh, those who who believed uh, maybe 10 years ago that these major problems would would be solved through energy were very wrong um and actually what energy has managed to do is exacerbate these problems so we need to move away from that line of thinking and find new new ways of of transcending perhaps issues that concern everyone and and as gabby mentioned um, uh, and the environment, climate change, uh, renewable uh, energy, and and all that stuff, which is uh, to everyone's concern, is is very is, is the future. Uh, could potentially, under conditions, become the platform for um, some kind of cooperation. But this doesn't eliminate the fact that we still have problems to overcome. How, for example, would uh, Israel and Lebanon um, find themselves in the same international forum? How would Turkey and Cyprus do that? Um, how, um, I, I don't know, how would Greece allow Turkey to participate in such a parallel structure? Because that's what, what I was referring to. Um, and um, the only thing I can think of is, is that we need to have more dialogue. And perhaps we need to come to some sort of a of a minimum agreement on on issues that we need to discuss without letting that spilling over into um, into traditional fears and concerns, either when it comes to threats or uh, when it comes to issues of um, recognition. That we need to to take all that uh, geopolitical and legal even load off. Uh, these discussions and try to to work our way up from somewhere that is, you know, a common concern. I know I am very well aware that this sounds idealistic and romantic, but um, um, perhaps uh, we need we need to start thinking like that if we're to unlock uh, the prospects of the region, because otherwise we're just locked to what has been there for the past 50 years. And that, that cannot be the solution. Thanks, uh, Zenona. Very, very clear. So we need to look for uh, common denominators uh, and to change uh, a narrative and uh, open uh, a window for uh, dialogues. Uh, turning to, to Turkey, there are uh, a couple of questions uh, about Turkey. The first one is uh, why Turkey's activity in the Eastern Mediterranean is uh, usually labeled uh, as a warring neo-Ottomanism, while the same attitude from other stakeholders uh, in the area are generally seen as uh, simply action to pursue their strate strategic vision. Mitat, would you like to, to answer this yeah. question? Yes, Valeria. In fact, uh, I feel a, like a Russian academic, you know, uh, most probably when we are discussing Eastern Mediterranean or, or, or Black Sea related security issues or the Caucasus related, uh, Russia bashing is, is a, I don't know, a kind of a, uh, attitude. And now Eastern Mediterranean related issues or the Black Sea related issues, Turkey emerges as a other. Uh, of course, this is a presentation on Turkey's attitude as a person or academic. I'm also very critical of some attitudes of the current government in Turkey and by saying that this neo-Ottomanism or other kind of an expansionist uh, labels on Turkish foreign policy are, I, uh, I don't know, uh, they are not realistic. Uh, they are a kind of an imagination. Of course, you can easily find some 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 groups or people within Turkey itself uh, who, who are supporting such a kind of an idea. But, you know, this was over. Uh, now, Turkey has to face with the realities of its region, 
uh, and the realities of, uh, of the, the, the global politics as well. This is related with capacity and capability. You know, oh, do you have any resources? Do you have any interest? And is it sustainable to follow such a kind of a policy? Therefore, assertive and aggressive policies are acceptable for Turkey itself unless they are serving the interest of all those neighboring countries. Now we are discussing Turkey in different regions from the Eastern Mediterranean to Caucasus, from the Black Sea region to the Middle East. And you see active Turkey dealing with its own issues from terror to balance the other topics. Therefore, domestic issues are, are also prevailing around in Turkey and in Turkey emerges whether it's a reliable and, and loyal actor in its Western uh, links and relations is an important thing. Uh, why we have such a kind of a labels? Of course, part of the blame is on Turkey, especially the current government since 2006-07 follow such a kind of a policy, uh, a kind of a zero problems with its neighbors. But the, at the end, we have many issues with our neighbors from Greece to Syria, from Iraq to Israel, from Egypt to, uh, to, to let me say, uh, Bulgaria as well. And these are the issues that we have to face with in Turkey. But what makes Turkey unique in those issues? Uh, we are not, uh, or Turkey is not Russia. Therefore, there is a kind of a vivid and, and very lively discussion and opposition within Turkey itself to change Turkey's track. But how to resolve those issues? It is not only Turkey's capacity to offer such a kind of a resolution all those issues. Uh, for example, a couple of weeks ago, we have NATO summit, and Turkey was one of the signatories of this NATO summit meeting and actively participated in any kind of activities. You see, for example, Turkey as an active contributor to, to, to Black Sea uh, dry, drills or, or ex, ex, exercises. And then in the Eastern Mediterranean, I, I agree with my colleagues, we need a kind of a sea change in, 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 in fact, with the participation of all those governments. As Alessia mentioned, Turkey and Egypt. And then as Gabriel mentioned, many people supporting Turkey's change and the priorities over uh, Israel and Egypt. And I don't know whether it's under those current circumstances, whether Turkey has managed to change its policy priorities, but you know, the price is getting higher and higher in day, in day by day. And it seems that Turkey or Turkish policy makers or decision makers need, are in need of changing their attitude and, and the, of course, narrative. Therefore, this narrative of neo-Ottomanist Turkey is, 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 is destructive, not only for Turkey and for the, the, the other regional actors, but Turkey's relations with the others as well. Therefore, we need to create such a kind of a, a new narrative to, to move forward. Uh, we need to see much more Western actors, and there are clues, in fact. Turkish-Greek talks is going on. Turkish-Egyptian talks are going on. Most probably, Turkish-Israeli connections and talk are going on. And at the end, most probably, in a dynamic environment, we may end up with a new policy and new uh, worldview, but it depends also Turkey's domestic politics as well. Thank you, Mitaka. Mitata. Uh, remaining on, uh, on Turkey, two, two quick questions. Uh, why did Turkey's uh, blue homeland maritime doctrine become so popular among the policy elite, military leaders uh, and uh, ordinary people? This is the first question. And then uh, an evaluation from your side. Do you think that uh, um, the assertive pol foreign policy in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean has been uh, effective for, from uh, your perspective? Uh, let's start with this. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am on. Uh, let me start with this uh, bl uh, blue uh, homeland. It's, a, it's defined and considered by many other players, especially uh, by rivals, as I said. But, you know, for the uh, Turkish poly policymakers, as I mentioned, in my presentation, the threat perception is prevailing. Uh, there is a kind of a threat perception. I'm not supportive of this, this uh, aura and understanding, uh, but the first component is about the fear of being under attack or being circled by the outside powers. And 
The second component is about the regional ambitions of Turkey. And this blue homeland policy serves those ambitions and uh, funnels, of course, uh, uh, the, the threat perception as well. Uh, and the, the, the inventors of this policy, in fact, they are not popular as a person in Turkish policy or, or daily politics, but their suggestion served, in fact, uh, for, the, for the future perspective. It's a kind of an illuminative roadmap, in fact. Uh, it defines Turkey's axis of geopolitical zones of influence and defense. And therefore, the threat perception helped the others to use, especially the government, to use this term to bring all the opposition all together as well under those circumstances. And this ISMAT Energy Forum, this was a threat for the others. And this is the reason why we are discussing uh, the, the, the balance to balance the others within the region. Uh, and if Turkey considers that the developing energy alliance in this matter has threatened the, uh, to append its Turkey's energy policy, the primary goal has been to maintain Turkey's position as an energy hub between the east and west and north and south. And how you can familiarize or how to bring the other people together in Turkey and this blue stream or blue uh, homeland narrative had to bring all the groups, even the opposition groups in, 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 in Turkey, uh, and to move forward. And it also contributes Turkey's security, naval security, maritime security uh, perspective as well. And this was the reason. But last couple of, let me say, months, you don't hear the, the word, in fact, within Turkey as well. And what happened to admirals, these are also related with Turkey's domestic politics, as I said. Uh, and for the government or the presidential administration, there is a kind of an expectation to have a kind of a success story after Syrian operations or what happened in, in Iraq uh, to fight against terrorism. What makes uh, the government very effective or assertive in, the, in, the, in its neighborhood and its regions was Blue Homeland. Then most probably what's happening in the Caucasus put uh, all those Blue Homeland related issues aside and Turkey has changed its direction towards EU and Greece for negotiations. For example, eight months ago or the, the, at the beginning of this year, it was unimaginable for many, uh, not only in Turkey, but in the region as well. Therefore, this has as a kind of a new invention to develop a new perspective for the, for the groups in Turkey. This is, this is the reason, but it, it, it is a kind of an unproductive uh, thing at the end. Thank you, Mitat. Uh, looking at the role of uh, international players uh, in, uh, in the area, there is a, uh, an interesting question on uh, Russia to uh, all the panelists. Uh, how do you see Russia's uh, interest and behaviors as both uh, a major producer and exporter of hydrocarbons and a power willing to play a relevant role uh, in, uh, in the Mediterranean? would like to answer this question. Maybe Gabi? Sure, I'll give it a shot. Um, obviously, uh, Russia has historically uh, been an important actor in the Eastern Mediterranean, continues to uh, be an important actor, both uh, due to its strategic uh, base of operations in Syria, its role in the Syrian civil, uh, civil war, its support uh, or, or uh, engagement with actors like Turkey, but also actors like Hezbollah and, uh, and it, the role that it's played in Libya. So um, Russia is a, a, is a constant, um, just the same way that the Eastern Mediterranean is Europe's backyard. Russia, at the very least, can try to make similar claims. Um, and of course, the Eastern Mediterranean um, for decades was an, uh, uh, a theater of American operations, which uh, I have no doubt that uh, actors in Russia are, are more, more than happy to fill the void um, as the United States slowly withdraws from the region. So I think that when it comes to Russia's engagement, there are two separate ways of, of looking at it. First, Russia uh, is not particularly threatened by uh, Eastern Mediterranean hydrocarbons, which comparatively do not match 
uh, its own uh, capacity, um, but it doesn't have any issue playing a small spoiler role, um, even though at this present moment, it seems like the actors of the Eastern Mediterranean can handle that on their own and they don't necessarily need all that much Russian interference. Um, but certainly it's in Russia's interest that there continue to be uh, outstanding disputes between Eastern Mediterranean actors and in particular, between Turkey and the other actors of the region. Turkey as a member of NATO, uh, and at least historically an important member uh, within the, the transatlantic alliance, um, seems to be shifting in an independent or more independent direction. So long as that occurs, and so long as Turkey's uh, issues with other Eastern Mediterranean states are not resolved, that serves and works to Russia's advantage. So um, certainly if you're looking to kind of contain Russia's influence, that's perhaps the most important place to start. But Russia is here and, and Russia is not going, and going away anytime soon. And uh, my expectation is that in the coming years, Russian companies are going to try to explore and exploit uh, offshore hydrocarbon resources, whether in the waters of Lebanon or in Syria, um, and so the Russian angle is going to uh, be ever present. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gabby. And uh, I would like to turn to, to Alessia as uh, Russia and uh, Egypt uh, were on, uh, on the same page, on the same side uh, in, uh, in Libya. So Alessia, from uh, your point of view, what's uh, Russia's role uh, in, uh, in the region? Um, yes, the, the role of Russia in uh, Libya has been and is uh, really important, especially I think in this particular moment. But uh, also I think that uh, Libya is not really strategic for Russia, it's more static. And uh, for this reason I think that uh, he um, tried to avoid a direct confrontation with Turkey and the other side. Of course this remain a problem and Egypt uh, also have to deal with uh, if uh, it wants to diffuse tension in the country and create this sort of uh, appeasement with uh, Turkey or uh, ease uh, this uh, uh, rapprochement, with this possible rapprochement. Um, also, I agree what, uh, with what uh, Gabriel stated about the role, the, the, the increasing role of Russia in the Eastern Mediterranean, maybe in the next future. But uh, also, I think that um, another time, if we look at the general context that is uh, underway in, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, so this sort of changing in alliance. Uh, maybe it's possible to uh, think about the uh, possibility of diffusing tension and uh, paving the way for a possible initiative to promote a more cooperative security architecture. In this case, I think that both uh, European Union and NATO should uh, have a more active role and uh, encourage uh, enhancing the uh, their already existing program of engagement and cooperation, such as the Mediterranean dialogue and the European neighbor policies, which suffered during the, the, the last decade uh, of a lack of interest, commitment, and uh, of course, implementation. And I think that the space left by this. Uh, uh, treatment of the United States uh, should uh, have been filled, should be filled by, of course, and the new uh, uh, America of Biden, uh, and uh, uh, of course by a new role that the EU and the NATO should and uh, I think will uh, uh, will carry it out in the in the next future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alessia. We are uh, getting to, to the end, almost to the end uh, to, this, uh, to this panel. But I would like to ask uh, uh, to all of you a, a question uh, from a, a European perspective. How do you see uh, the role of, uh, of the EU? What role for uh, uh, the EU from uh, the regional perspective, from the perspective of different uh, Regional, uh, regional countries. Who would like to, to answer first uh, the, this question? Mitat, Gabriel, Zenonas, yeah, yes. 
Just, uh, go first. <laughs> just very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's not much to say, so I'll be quick anyway. <laughs> I mean, um, we know that the EU has a fundamental problem, uh, you know, having a coherent um, foreign policy. And the Eastern Mediterranean is not an exception. Actually, the Eastern Mediterranean is one of the, of the most problematic areas for the EU, given that they have this, um, uh, these two main problems that are now uh, blocking somehow um, decisions within the EU, uh, this triangle between the EU, Turkey, and what is happening in the Eastern Mediterranean with, with Greece and Cyprus. So I believe that if the EU were to play a positive role in various ways, either by pressuring or incentivizing actors in the region to overcome their problems through a European framework, uh, that would definitely unlock um, uh, the dif different possibilities in the Eastern Mediterranean. But we have so far seen that there is a great difficulty in achieving that, because um, obviously there are various different interests within the EU um, that, by extension, block any um, united um, efforts um, to, you know, to, to accomplish one specific thing, and they tend to go different ways. Uh, so I'm I'm not very hopeful uh, about about how how effective the EU can be uh, in the area. Thank you, Zenonas. So no, not positive uh, about the role of the EU, but it's a uh, very realistic uh, your your position, of course. So uh, we get. We get to the end of uh, our panel. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your uh, interventions, for this uh, uh, very uh, insightful and fruitful uh, discussion. Let me thank uh, uh, also all people uh, that uh, attended uh, uh, virtually this, uh, this panel. And last but not least, I, I would like to, to thank my, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, Igor, uh, Beatrice and Erika for their uh, precious uh, support. So thank you very much and uh, have a good uh, evening. See you, see you next time. See you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.